Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I'm joined in studio today, as always, by President Wyatt. Scott, how are you? Terrific, Steve. Thank you very much. It's good to see you today, and uh, it is a crisp January day in 2020 as we are recording this. And this is part of an ongoing series of podcasts about um, the uh, the widespread uh, message that is being sent right now out through the media, certainly within higher ed, but outside of higher ed as well, that there is a real looming crisis approaching higher education. And much of this has to do with concerns about enrollment. It's, it's deeper than that. It, it's um, the way people think about higher education, how much they feel uh, it, uh, it is useful in terms of a return on investment. Um, there, so there are other reasons, but, but it will manifest itself, at least according to these reports, largely through declining enrollment and perhaps even steeply declining enrollment. Anyway, we have a nationally recognized uh, uh, guest today to talk to us about college closures and some of the impacts that these types of uh, difficulties, challenges that we're going to be facing will bring to us in the coming years. So why don't you introduce her? So we're delighted to be joined today by Stephanie Niles, who's the Vice President for Enrollment and Communications at Ohio Wesleyan University. And, and also, Stephanie, you're the immediate past president for the National Association for College Admission Counseling. Welcome. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much. I'm glad to join you this evening. Yeah, we're honored that you would spend some time talking with us. Where's Ohio Wesleyan? Ohio Wesleyan is in Delaware, Ohio, which sits about 25 miles north of Columbus. There you go. Beautiful part of the world. It is. It is. It is. And, and a bit balmy here for January, actually. Not, not maybe as crisp as it is in Utah at the moment, so well, it should be. There you go. <laughs> Stephanie, I've spent some time in Ashland, Ohio, at Ashland University. Oh, uh, yeah, not far away. Yeah, it isn't very far away, it's, and it is a beautiful place. Um, every time I'm back in Ohio, one of the things that I love are the um, lightning bugs. Oh, yeah. The yeah. fireflies. <laughs> That's right. This part of the country is known for them. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I worked for four, almost 14 years in Indiana, and so I was happy about a year and a half ago to take this job in Ohio with a kind of meeting in the middle, settling in the middle of my two former home states. <laughs> we don't have anything like that out here. No. And, <laughs> and to sit out on the lawn at sunset and just watch all these bugs jumping around, that is just really kind of thrilling for a Rocky Mountain Western sort of guy. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Why don't you uh, um, tell us just a little bit about yourself? Give us, a, give us your biography in a minute. Sure. So I'm in my 23rd year in enrollment. Uh, began my career at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana. Worked my way up. Uh, after earning a master's degree at Indiana University and a bachelor's degree at University of Virginia, worked my way up uh, to the vice president for admission and financial aid, returned to my hometown in Pennsylvania, where I worked for a small Christian private institution for a few years before trying my hand then at a women's college in Virginia. Um, spent several years there and then returned to Pennsylvania, uh, went to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and then had an opportunity to move to Ohio, to Ohio Wesleyan, about a year and a half ago. Um, along the way, I completed a doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania in higher education management. And I've had some terrific opportunities to serve in leadership roles throughout the 
um, the affiliates of our National Association for College Admission Counseling in the state or region where I was living. I was the president um, in Indiana before I moved away from there. And then um, I am in my third and final year as um, a member of the board of directors of the National Association for College Admission Counseling, currently serving as the immediate past president of the association. Well, uh, I think it's fair to say that you've been around a bit and you um, are well read. And certainly the way we became acquainted with you was from your writing in the Chronicle, um, articles about enrollments and so we yes, think that was, you, you may be one of the people that we're talking to that has um, is familiar with this as anybody. Well, I know the uh, article that I wrote, that short piece, was um, preceded by a longer piece that was written by um, the current vice president for enrollment at Bucknell University. And then there were five of us who essentially wrote uh, short pieces in response to the issues and the challenges that Bill Connolly presented that his institution is facing and then those of us representing other institutions, other parts of the country, other perspectives, um, were able to reflect on some of those challenges that uh, the demographics, um, the challenges related to college cost, the uh, way in which, as you mentioned earlier, the way in which students and their families are valuing or devaluing, in many cases, uh, higher education and pursuit of a degree, and all the associated issues that our industry is facing. Your short little article in the recent Chronicle starts out with this sentence. We have entered into a time of unprecedented uncertainty. Why don't you elaborate on that for us? Sure. You know, I, I remember a few years ago when I was still at Hollins University in Virginia, I, my president was sitting on the stage at a, um, a workshop that I was attending, and she talked about how that this is the most challenging that her job has been that she has seen in the 40 plus years that she's spent in higher education. And that was a little bit of an aha moment for me to hear your own president reflect on how challenging it is in such a long and, and storied career. And, you know, that was six -ish years ago. And frankly, I think it has only gotten more challenging with um, the, the things that I referenced earlier, the, the escalation of college costs without the, increase in family income to offset uh, those experiences, the, the institutions now that we've started to see close, um, and the way that those institutions that are particularly vulnerable, given low endowment, given the changing demographics in this country, um, that, that there are some real, real challenges there. And, you know, even in my role with NACAC, you know, we've recently seen that uh, in response to the D U.S. Department of Justice's antitrust division investigation into our code of ethics of professional practice, we now have three um, formerly mandatory items that have been removed from that code, and they are no longer enforceable for our members, which really has the potential to change the way in which we operate as institutions and we recruit students and students come to us, find us, select our institutions, how we can prepare for those students. So I think there's, we, you know, we could talk about any one of those issues for an entire podcast or more, but I think that, that hopefully that gives some sense of the real unprecedented uncertainty that's being posed at this particular point in time. We have a vice president that works with us that grew up in a state, New England, um, mm -hmm. that has had four colleges closed in the last two years. Mm -hmm. My Not, husband grew up in in Vermont, which is one of those uh, one of those states that has had several colleges close. Massachusetts, of course, has seen several close. You know, it's it's a uh, it's a challenge, and I know you know, and, and you uh, probably have read the same things I have, where you know some of the institutions that are seeing their endowments are below a hundred million dollars, that they're um, they're really dependent, very dependent on tuition revenue. Um, that their student populations are under a thousand students, um, that there isn't some niche program that they are really able to rely on to serve a, a need within the educational community or communities they serve. These are some of the institutions that are, I think, most at risk. And, and I think if we look at some of the examples of institutions that have closed, you know, we've seen that they will certainly fall into these categories. 
So some schools have a bit more risk than others. Mm -hmm. But let's just assume for the sake of discussion that every institution should take advantage of the climate that's out there or should be aware of what's going on and find the way to make their school stronger as a result. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, what are the really... main... What are the main messages? Well, I, I think that what you said is really key. I think for an institution to um, not take stock, to not be willing to ask the hard questions, to not be willing to, to really take a look at itself, what it does well, who it serves, is there another population it should be serving? Are there opportunities being missed? Are there things the institution's doing, programs it's delivering um, that are not as effective are not resonating and capturing the population needed, I think each and every, almost each and every institution is in a position now to have to really take stock of themselves and ask those, those tough questions. I know my institution is currently in, in a position of doing that. We're doing both an academic and an administrative review that, frankly, I think is exciting because it's presenting us with opportunities to really take a good, hard look at, at who we are. At, at, at asking and answering some of those questions that I just posed and, and making some changes. We can't think about just next year or just three years from now, but if we want to sustain the institution for 20, 30, 50 years or beyond, that's going to be de somewhat dependent on the decisions that we make now. It, I'm very interested in this because uh, we talked a little bit about this um, off the air. I'm using air quotes now for off the air, uh, but anyway. Uh, so, in this in this self evaluation, is it in fact a self evaluation, or have you hired uh, an external uh, partner to come in and help you with it? We have hired an external partner to help us with the administrative review, but at this point in time, the academic review is being conducted internally, led by our associate provost for institutional effectiveness. And so we are actually in the process of finalizing a contract with a firm that does this kind of work for many institutions and will spend the spring essentially taking a hard look at our administrative practices, um, how we staff ourselves, uh, the, the programs and services we deliver to our students. And then on the uh, academic side, this process is ongoing, looking at academic programs, uh, looking at the cost associated with those programs from a from a staffing perspective, a, a program perspective, a facility perspective, um, this individual and I are also um, using a third party vendor to do a research project, looking at uh, uh, what are the opportunities we might be missing, looking at the market that we are sitting in, that we're located in, are there opportunities perhaps at the graduate level, perhaps in online education that we can bring back to the faculty and talk more about if there's opportunities, if there's a market for programmatic initiatives that we could fill, particularly looking at some of the things we do particularly well, you know, can we move into those areas and, and look for new sources of revenue through new populations that we might serve? Stephanie, does this lead to reallocation of resources, new programs, closing programs, shifting programs? Uh it certainly could lead to all of the above, and and where there's no uh, predetermined um, supposed outcome at this point, it's it's really looking at all of those options on the table. We've we've talked about, for example, adding an esports program. Um, haven't taken that it further in terms of any formal steps, but it's something that we've looked at. Obviously, there'd be some costs involved in that, but you know, does the investment on the front end offset the potential revenue we might generate from students who would be attracted to us based on both the extracurricular as well as potentially the curricular opportunities that that could provide to students. Um, there may be programs that we would look to close potentially if those programs are not necessarily serving um, the right population. And, and those, those answers, we do, I don't have answers at hand. I have no predetermined thought that it's going to be this program or that program, but um, there's some you know, really a deep dive into uh, a wide range of data that will help uh, tell us, um, help us make some of those decisions, give us some of those answers. 
So this is a this is a process that you're going through, and we're not. Um, um, it's impossible to predict the um, results of it, of course. But this right. is a process that every school should be going through, right? I believe so. I, I think it's I think it's healthy. I think um, you know it's it's not easy, and we have spent a lot of time as a senior leadership team talking about our community, right? Our particularly our, our faculty, our staff. How do we ensure that that um, that individuals remain motivated, remain committed to the work they're doing. You know, there's no, while there may, not every person who is currently employed may be employed in the jobs they're currently working in, in the future. But there, again, is not any um, notion that we're looking to eliminate a particular area or department or program or service. So, you know, I think there's a real opportunity for people to um, contribute their ideas and their thoughts. And we've had some really good input from our community as well. Um, who we've asked people to share with us what are what are the ideas do they have for um, both generating new revenue as well as cutting costs, and that's been a great way to engage the community to really ask our faculty and our staff to think about what we do and how we do it. Have people um, take some ownership in the process. I think that uh, this kind of review is mm-hmm. uh, is one of those things that can be a great political challenge at a university. Are you finding it to be the case that everyone's hair is on fire, for lack of a better I, term? Or I think we, that's what we're trying to prevent, right? We're, with, we're really asking ourselves, and, and this was important in choosing the, the firm that we hope to work with, that they were attentive to, to giving us tools and resources to keep the community engaged, um, to ensure that that you know, that there was the communication tools would be robust, that they would help us to craft how we might message to the community so people were aware, we were transparent, they were feeling a part of the process. Um, and again, could really see that this isn't just our institution. This is a healthy, important process to sustain the institution for future generations. Um, and, you know, it's not just about the here and now. This is really for us to. Uh, ensure uh, long-term prosperity. Well, no one's secure unless the organization is secure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so and the, the, the best way to get security for employees is to make sure that the organization itself is secure and solid. Mm-hmm. Well, and certainly from my perspective, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of these questions from an enrollment perspective. So I'm particularly invested in the, the questions that we are asking ourselves around programmatic opportunities. How do we consider growth uh, in terms of graduate or online, as I referenced earlier, or how do we consider scaling back? You know, do we want to be smaller than we are if that means we retain more students, we enroll them in a smaller selection of majors that we've invested in even more heavily than we do now? Um, Are we building or adding to that set of majors at the same time that we're, we're cutting back. So it's, it's a real interesting puzzle um, to put together. And, you know, it's all being presented in this time of a demographic shift. And Ohio, I read an article a week or so ago that referenced Ohio as one of four states particularly challenged by demographics. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, we, there's a liberal arts college on every corner here <laughs> in, right. in Ohio, just about. And so, uh, you know, and, and we are we are just over half of our students come to us from Ohio. So roughly 47 percent come from all other parts of the country and, and beyond. Um, but we also know there's been some interesting changes there as well in terms of how far students are willing to travel. If you look back at data from 1990, something like the percentage of students who would travel more than 100 miles from home to go to school was about... Uh, Gosh, I think it was I think it was over 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 sixty percent, and now it's less than fifty percent. Um, so that has shifted as well. Students are much more likely to stay closer to home, and so you know institutions that at one point in time were even more national are in some cases becoming more regional. And so again, for those of us that sit in these demographically challenged areas, you know we we really have to ask ourselves some 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 of these difficult questions in I think an even more um, time-sensitive way. I had a son-in-law that just graduated from Campbell University Medical School. Mm-hmm. Campbell is mm-hmm. down in North Carolina. And yeah. 
I remember visiting with some folks down there while I was visiting the campus for his graduation and talking with them about the fact that the actual Campbell campus, and Campbell's a private and uh, uh, religious-based school, uh, the actual campus is is quite small and quite old. But mm-hmm. if you look at where the growth has taken place at Campbell, it's entirely in graduate professional programs in medical school and uh, nursing school and law school. Um, they So they've... They have, and this person made really no bones about the fact that that the graduate and professional programs had made it so that the undergraduate uh, programs could continue. That was the only way they were going to be able to stay in business. And and as you have suggested, these are these are some of the hard choices that that uh, particularly private colleges and universities, I think, are are having to make, where they don't have yeah. a legislature to to help them with but but do you find that that it's uh th- that it's this sense of an emergency or a, a pending emergency that it's helping you get these things done helping you get that that it's helping people be motivated i think so again i, I think partially it's looking around at the environment and recognizing that most institutions are challenged by some of the same challenges we face with enrollment growth and rising college costs and attracting students to these programs when they're, you know, we've got neighbors down the street with um, offering more, more money or meeting greater, greater percentage of need. You know, so, so I think many of our employees, partially because we're trying to share that information with them and partially because they're, they're reading and they're listening and they're talking to colleagues as well. They're, they're seeing that this, isn't just an Ohio Wesleyan issue or isn't just an issue for colleges in Ohio, but again, across much of the country, many institutions, you know, are, are facing these, these similar challenges. I think too, when you, you talked about, you asked about the political piece and I was thinking about that from a a faculty perspective. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think that's really critical is retaining a sense of mission you know, being true to the institution's mission, the reasons why it was founded in the first place, but recognizing that over time, over in many cases, 100, 200 or more years that um, institutions have been available, been been founded in this country, that um, things have changed. And, you know, what, when I had attended a, a program or a talk a couple of years ago and the person said, it's important to remember in times like these that there have always been times like these. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, you know, I've thought about that a lot since then because I wonder if this is one of those circumstances where, going back to where we started, you know, this is a time of unprecedented change. Is this different than any other time in history? And are we on the cusp of something really new and different that at least for the next 20 years, will have a, a significant impact. You know, technologies are so very different now than they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago and developing at such a faster rate than they were at those time periods. And we're all impacted by the changes in technology in so many different ways. You know, that in and of itself as a factor, I think is unprecedented and, and has the ability to really impact um, higher education going forward. Well, Stephanie, you, you, um, there's a, it's an interesting set of demographics that we're looking at. And one of the things is, as you've pointed out in your article in the Chronicle, is that we've, we're seeing some declining enrollments in the country as a whole. Mm-hmm. It's a little different from place to place. Utah's still growing, but we'll, right. we'll probably. But our birth rate is not growing. But our birth rate yeah. has gone down like yeah. everybody else. Mm-hmm. But we take we take a national um, perspective of declining enrollments, and then we put on top of that a few of these schools that you're very familiar with: Southern New Hampshire, Grand Canyon, Western yeah. Governors, Arizona State, that have these massive enrollment goals. I think Western Governors said they have a goal of reaching one million students. Right. Wow. These yeah. some of these. Um, I don't know that this is the right term, but these kind of mega universities or universities that are that have these huge goals. 
if they reach half of their goals, mm -hmm. the growth that they'll experience is the equivalent of hundreds of universities combined enrollments. So, mm -hmm. so not only do we see the enrollment challenges from a declining uh, interest in going to college or a smaller number of students that are there to go to college nationally, but this huge competition from these big businesses. It almost feels to me like um, it's kind of like a whole bunch of small farms that are now going out because of the big corporate farms. Right. Or bank right. consolidation that happened yeah. in the 80s and 90s. Where now there are only a half a dozen so, banks in the world. So in other words, not only are there fewer students to go around, but with some of these institutions now looking to expand in such dramatic ways, will that also have an impact yeah, that's right. on the, the potential of Western governors, governors captures a million, <laughs> you know, recognizing the percentage of, you know, the number of students even available to go to college, um, at least in the traditional age population, we know they will serve a, a much broader population, but you're right. That's, that's certainly another fear or concern for institutions like mine um, that are largely bricks and mortar, largely serving traditional aged population of students, you know, in a largely regional um, area. But how, you know, how might that be affected by um, some of these other alternatives, which, you know, I see Southern New Hampshire on TV and, and on the internet. I think every time I get on Facebook, I yeah. some sort of advertisement pops up. So they're certainly pouring their resources into creating uh, a real sense of visibility. Yes, and it's probable that uh, some of the closures of universities and colleges in New England have come as a result mm -hmm. of New Hampshire's growth. Sure, it has to sure. Be. I would not, I would not be surprised. You know that that certainly and the the demographics that we are aware of in that in that part of the country. Yeah, you know, when you mentioned Utah's growth, I was sort of chuckling to myself. I remember number of years ago when there was talk about particularly Nevada and the growth there and you know inst both institutions would started to send representatives there and, and several institutions opened branch campuses there uh, you know and, and it's interesting because they many were not successful in capturing the market share they expected again I think for some of the reasons we've discussed they were students who were um, more interested in remaining closer to home um, as we see most, you know, many students in the country are today. Um, it's, it's, you know, only something like, gosh, 6%, I think, that will travel more than 500 miles away from, from home for school. And so for me to spend a lot of time and energy in, you know, a place like Nevada or Utah is not likely to be particularly fruitful, even with the growth there. You know, unless I, I really look at capturing a, a, a small niche or again, have a program or an opportunity that might draw those students to my campus. Yeah, I would have been hesitant to travel a long distance when I was a college age kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For a million reasons. Sure, um, sure. By, by I the think time about I, a colleague of mine. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, by the time I got to graduate school, then I was willing to go anywhere. But as an undergrad, I, I wanted to stay close to home. Well, and all sorts of reasons, right? I think about a colleague of mine who's worked in admission and recruited students all over the country and now works in college counseling and is invited at a strong private school in the Midwest, is advising students to, you know, look broadly across the country, don't limit their options. And and this individual's daughter is now looking to go to co is college bound. And I think she's not going to end up playing sports, but for a long time, it looked like she would. And they really limited her search to about a three-hour radius so they could travel to, you know, see her play. You know, families today, I think, you know, we, we all know about helicopter parents. And <laughs> yeah. that's, uh, you know, right? but, but, but there is, I think, a sense of family unity that, you know, has, has, has come from, in some ways, the enhanced communication that, that uh, our devices have allowed us to achieve, how much more connected students are to their their parents, the role that parents are you know, playing in their lives for, for good or for ill. Um, but I do think that sort of that family unit or those connections to family is another uh, piece that we're dealing with as well. Well, Steve and I are both from strong families and um, strong extended families. And 
and we fully understand the value of family and how helpful Absolutely. family can be. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. You know, Stephanie, when I grew up with a father who uh, loved books, uh, floor to ceiling mm-hmm. bookshelves in his den, and, and we just never threw away books because they were sacred, sort of. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and I, I have the sense that there's that same feeling about colleges and universities, that there's that there's a, a, a sacredness, uh, that's not the right, not the right word, but you know what I mean. There's a, um, there's something about a college and a university, an apartness that, that hurts us all a little bit when we see one fail or close. And, Mm -hmm. and part of your, um, part of your article is more colleges are going to close and you've already outlined some of the uh, warning signs that might be uh, you know, for a, a, a small enrolled college or a private school with a very small endowment or, or some of the other sure. things. But I guess my question is, so we've always had colleges close. From your national perspective, uh, what, when do we begin to worry? Uh, is 10 a year an acceptable amount and 25 is a bubble bursting or, I mean, I'm, I know I'm asking you to crystal ball this just a little bit, but, but where do we, where do we start to really be gravely concerned about college closures? Yeah, that, that is a good question. And, and I don't know that I have a, a good answer. You know, I think it's obviously we watch the demographics. We want to be sure that we can uh, continue to serve the educational needs of college bound students. We know that college-bound students, however, are not all ages 18 to 24. You know, that that average age of a, of a student enrolled in college has shifted and they are older. And so it, as that continues, if that continues, it may be that the traditional bricks-and-mortar campuses are not as relevant to meet the needs of, of all students. You know, we've also all heard about how the jobs that exist today um, are not necessarily the ones that students who are enrolled in college today will be working in 10 years from now. And that, you know, I, I read just another, uh, an article the other day, I think it said about 60% of the jobs, you know, 10 years from now don't exist yet, or 15 years from now don't exist yet. So, you know, wow, what, what, 60%. I, I, yeah, I, I was, I was a bit shocked by that too. And I thought, well, what are the educational opportunities that need to be presented to those students when we don't even know yet what those, you know, what those options are. Um, You know, I think about social media and communications and how 10 years ago we were not talking about Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or, you know, any of these as a tool to be used in the recruitment of students or to market an institution or create an enhanced visibility for an institution. And now we have departments devoted to um, that, and not just at institutions, obviously, we see that in, in other industries as well. But it certainly is a, um, for me, it's a sort of an ongoing example of how quickly things can change, and how we are really going to have to prepare ourselves for, <laughs> for changes that we don't yet know what exactly will look like. Yeah, and we have academic departments that are leading students to degrees in social media. Mm-hmm. I was just talking sure. the other day with a business owner, and his total marketing budget goes to Facebook. It's, it's only marketing. Wow. Well, and the, the amount of, you know, we talked a bit about some of the institutions looking to attract large numbers of students. I mean, the amount of money that can be spent to be really impactful and effective in marketing, you know, is in certainly the millions of dollars, but you certainly see how that pays off in creating a sense of awareness and visibility. You know, who, who doesn't know about Southern New Hampshire university? And I know sometimes I, I know I live in an educational bubble and so not everybody may know in the way I do, but I think that, you know, general public is pretty aware because they've worked hard to, um, make themselves relevant to such a broad population of people. Yes, and um, some of those those schools have, as you've pointed out, because you've seen the ads, and many of us have, that they're spending a lot of money on marketing. 
Absolutely. Huge, huge Absolutely. amount of money marketing. One of the things that you mentioned in your Chronicle article was the cost of education, that mm -hmm. family incomes haven't really grown that much over the last 20 years, but the cost of education continues to climb and has climbed much faster than inflation. How much of a factor do you think that is? I think that's a huge factor. It's something that I worry about every day and I see every day in the role that I play at Ohio Wesleyan. I see, you know, students who are eager for the type of education that we can provide to them. And yet our resources don't stretch far enough to meet the full financial need of every student. Um, more students come to us with, with that financial need. And, you know, families are concerned about taking out loans, taking they're they're not as easy to secure as they were 10 or 15 years ago before the, the recession um, and there's also the question around value as well so are they willing to spend the money will the degree pay off in the long run if they put the resources into it and then you and I can both cite articles right. which you know indicate that you know yes a college degree is necessary and the training and, and the skill sets that one develops in a a college um, curricular experience will help prepare them for all of the knowns and the unknowns in the future. But there's certainly a lot in the popular press about the lack of um, value in a college degree and the, you know, the need, the, the great debt that some students have gone into um, that they haven't seen pay off for them. And, you know, of course you get a, a few of those stories and they get a lot of attention that may not be the reality for all families, but you hear that and you start to become concerned about what your future might look like. Yeah. So and I, I think it's, no, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I just think it's a really critical issue. And, you know, the, I think it's the university of Chicago now, I think is the first institution to have crossed the $80,000 total cost threshold. And, you know, where, where is it going to stop? Um, at my former institution at Dickinson College, we had looked at the fact that in 13 years, and this was a couple of years ago, that we would cross the $100,000 threshold if we were to continue raising tuition and fees at the rate that we were at that particular time. You know, again, that's, that's not very far in the future. And there doesn't appear to be the same projection of family income increasing at that level. We know that there are more students of color who are college bound or who are of college going age. And that will only continue, that population will continue to grow. But typically those, those families, African-American and, and Latino families particularly don't have the same average income as your white families do. And so, you know, we're just seeing a, a change um, because of the demographics and what the, the college-going population looks like and how they perceive costs and what's really a reality for them. I remember a few years ago, you know, I would get appeals from students who were looking for more money to make college work. And, you know, they might, some of them needed the resources. Some were just playing a game. You know, it was, well, this school gave me a little more. Could you match that? And trying to see where they get the best deal. But I remember kind of coming into a time where it was no longer about, you know, this school gave me this, could you do a little bit better? But I can't afford to go anywhere, even though I have these four offers in hand. Is there any way you can help me more? And I feel like I hear more of that today than I certainly than I used to, you know, eight to 10 years ago. Yeah. And you and I can see the, uh, Steve, and you and I can see the return on investment of a college education. And we can make, um, with great data, a whole bunch of wonderful points about that. But it's not important what we think. What's important is is what the future students think. Absolutely. And uh, Absolutely. that's that's where it lies. But I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping, perhaps, that one of the outcomes of this crisis, if we can call it that, the enrollment uh, challenges that we're seeing across the country, I'm hoping that one of the outcomes is that we all recognize that the costs have continued to rise much faster than inflation, mm -hmm. and that perhaps there needs to be some serious look at the cost of higher education. It's certainly, exactly. it's certainly gonna be important as we see the demographics of the population of the United States shift. 
mm-hmm. um, to be a minority majority. Um, there's just so many people that can't afford to go. Well, and then there's, there's you know, an interesting set of questions that are posed when you start to look at college costs and, you know, institutions, obviously, who've made some decisions around resetting their tuition or reducing their tuition um, to match the in-state tuition at another institution or uh, rewarding certain populations, perhaps with a parent working in a public service field or, or something of that nature. You know, institutions have taken these steps. I, I would venture to say that not many of them have been particularly successful. They might recognize a year or two of enrollment gain and revenue gain, but it seems that oftentimes those gains are short-lived. If they're not followed by significant change, you know, within the institutional structure or curriculum that um, continues to allow families to seek out those options, that they're not as, um, you know, interested in, in, in making making that change. So, you know, I think that uh, it, it's tough for one institution to do it on its own, right? To to drop their tuition because you compete with other institutions. And so if, you know, we suddenly say we're worth $20,000 or we're going to cost $20,000 less, what's to prevent that student from saying, well, then you must be worth $20,000 less than, <laughs> you know, right. the, the institution next door, right? And, you know, we all know that there's this uh, Chivas Regal effect that very much exists in, uh, you know, in, in this process. My, my son is a college freshman and as he was, going through the, the search process, he um, go, went to a, a private high school and um, said, you know, mom, kids won't look at schools that don't cost a lot. You know, they, they think that cost says something about value. And, and, and that was not, I didn't feed that to him. He, he came up with that based on his own conversations with his, you know, well-educated classmates who came from well-educated backgrounds who really saw this alignment with cost equates to value. But to you know back to where we were, that the bubble is going to burst. I don't know where or when, but at some point it will. And how do we come together without being accused of colluding to try and find some answers to this issue? I, I read an article, an article recently about how to prepare for retirement. I don't know why I think about that, Steve. I don't know either. <laughs> Stephanie, I'm sure you're not nearly as old as Steve and I, but... Yeah. Fortunately, Steve's older than me, so he can tell me what it's like. Very good. <laughs> a year oh, ahead of. Gonna, I'm a, a year older ago, than you. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I read this article about preparing for retirement, and one of the points in it was: stop sending your children to expensive private schools, huh? because you need to put that money in your retirement account and um, find a find a school that's affordable. Mm-hmm. rather than the most expensive one that you can get your kid into. I thought that was an interesting yeah. <laughs> um, piece of it, advice. It but. is. And, you know, it's, uh, and that's what has led to the proliferation of merit scholarships, right? You know, every right. student getting a, a merit scholarship, for, particularly in some parts of the country. I mean, Ohio, for example, is a very merit-heavy, merit-rich market. Um, and we are vastly competing against each other with, you know, who, who gives and gets the bigger scholarship. Um, but, you know, we've done this to ourselves. We've done it in response to a need and a desire. But again, I think it, it is also out of control. You know, how can we meet the, the need of students truly with financial need if our monies are going towards students without? But will we enroll those students who have the resources to pay if they don't get that, co- that scholarship because they've come to expect it? So, it's a real conundrum, I think, at, at this point in time. Yeah, a lot of students want to go to a place where their ego is stroked. Yep. Mm-hmm. Where sure. I feel very valued. Somebody's given me a scholarship. I'm, there's something special about me. And, I don't, I, and that is po- fully understandable. Yep. But I'll tell you, in Utah, yep. um, it appears to us that at least in our part of the world, where we have almost no private schools, there's very few. Mm-hmm. Um, in Utah, we have of note Westminster. Two. We have Brigham Westminster and Brigham Young University. Mm-hmm. And um, in Nevada, there's not much. And the same thing's true with there's just fewer of them. Yeah, Arizona and Idaho and these places. Students sure. seem to be really focused on cost. 
they seem to be focused mm-hmm. on convenience and cost. Mm-hmm. And they're going to take the school that that will cost them the least and is the most convenient. You've already mentioned that about going to somewhere that's close to home. Right, right. And I think that makes that makes sense. You know, you think about how vastly different that is than, you know, the densely populated New England area, right, where there's there's so many options, so many different types of, of options, um, but where you know, there's a much longer history of certain types of institutions being relevant and present in, in that part of the country. And, you know, the different ways that families are willing to invest. But again, I still think we are in a position where it's, it's becoming no longer a question of a willingness for uh, a, po- a percentage of the population, but an ability to afford because of the escalating costs. You know, my, um, director of financial aid, former director of financial aid had I remember talking to him about a family with a half a million dollar income that was concerned about paying for private costs. I, I think about my current director and some of the comments that are, are made about, oh, this is a wealthy family. And that family has a, you know, $230,000 income, perhaps. That, that is absolutely in the context of this country, that is a wealthy family. So when you ask that family to take $65,000, out of their year, how many families have prepared themselves to make that sort of investment, you know, have saved for it or have downsized or changed the way they're conducting themselves on a daily basis, living their daily life to, you know, suddenly be able to put $65,000 towards their child's education. Yep. You're exactly right. Uh, Most people that live within 300 miles of our school would say they're not doing it. But th- mm-hmm. but this is this is interesting because of these um, the communities and the cultures that we grow up in. In Utah, there is one private liberal arts school, and oh, there and th- there are no public liberal arts schools. So we've got one. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a single liberal arts college in Nevada. Is there, Steve? I don't think so. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. If there is, we don't we haven't heard of it. Um. Yeah, it, it's, it's just a very uncommon thing yeah, in, the, in the Rocky Mountain states. Sure. And so in sure. some, in some ways that, that insulates us from some of the trouble that folks are having. But it also, we, we share many of the same problems uh, that uh, our sister institutions in New England would have, except ours is based on being uh, remote and rural. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, and so you suggest people don't want to go far away from home to mm-hmm. go to school. They you have to go far away from home to come to, to see come here. Yeah. 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 yeah, sure, yeah. So. sure. Well, Stephanie, one of the other. I'm just going to say one of the other articles was written by Rick Clark, who's at Georgia Tech, and and he wrote from a somewhat similar perspective of what you're talking about, where you know again they're in a area of growth. Um, many students coming from Georgia, very strong reputation, um, serving students particularly in the STEM field, which, you know, again, where many institutions are seeing increasing interest um, in those, those types of programs. So, you know, he, his perspective was very different on the enrollment, you know, looming enrollment crisis, if you will, because of the, the area of the country in which, you know, he, he sits. Um, I, again, I don't think any of us can afford to be complacent. But certainly not not all parts of the country are the same or are dealing with these issues in quite the same way. This has been a delight visiting with you. If if you had one piece of advice to give colleges and universities throughout the country, what, what would that one thing be in closing? I think it would go, be to go back to what we said before about asking tough questions. You know, do the work. Do the hard work. You know, Ensure that you are as an institution, really know who you are, who you will best serve, the ways in which you will best serve those populations. Ensure you aren't missing any opportunities that may exist. Be willing to take some calculated risk, but understand what that risk might look like through a a real thorough review of the data before taking that plunge. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. 
We've had join us by phone today from Delaware, Ohio, Stephanie Niles, who is the Vice President for Enrollment and Communications at Ohio Wesleyan University and also the immediate past president of the National Association for College Admission Counseling. We thank Stephanie for joining us, and we thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.